Welcome to the Robert Wenzel Show. Please stand by for Robert Wenzel. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Robert Wenzel Show. I'm Robert Wenzel. My guest today is Jeff Connaughton, who is the author of a new book, The Payoff, Why Wall Street Always Wins. Jeff holds an MBA with honors from the University of Chicago and a JD from Stanford Law School. He worked for the investment bank Smith Barney and E.F. Hutton, and then he worked for Joe Biden's presidential campaign as Deputy National Finance Director and then became Special Assistant when Biden chaired the Senate Judiciary Committee. Jeff, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Okay. I'll tell you, I find your book fascinating on many levels because I get the sense throughout the book that you didn't really feel Vice President Biden really acknowledged the efforts that you put out for him. Am, am I correct in uh, getting that sense from the book? We've got a 30-year relationship with Joe Biden. I met him when I was in college. I moved to Washington to work for his first presidential campaign. I worked for him on uh, his Senate staff. I stayed involved with him politically. And all that time, I had really sort of bonded with Ted Kaufman, his chief of staff, who was a mentor for me for decades. And the reason I told the Biden story was, uh, it's true, I never really clicked with Biden as much as I might have hoped. And yet, I sort of played along, because in Washington, you have to be connected to a person in power. It's like a feudal system, you know, with lords and serfs. And I was a Biden guy. And I sort of projected the image of myself as a Biden guy, because that's how I fit in Washington. When in reality, I was more of a Ted guy, you know, than a, than a Biden guy. <laughs> and so, you know, at the end of my sort of 30 years, you know, in Washington, Biden sort of wasn't there for me in any meaningful way. And that was a disappointment. But it was also, in my view, uh, sort of an echo of a fraud on Wall Street in that I was trying to be my own harshest critic. I mean, there are many different types of frauds. I start the book by talking about how in a presidential campaign, I mean, if you're not faking it, you're dead. You know, I mean, we, we were barely alive in the second Biden campaign, but you're constantly trying to convince people that, oh, no, we're going to win or we're going to come in second and that's going to propel us. You know, it feels fraudulent while you're doing it. So, so yeah, I had, I had a very complex relationship with Joe Biden. Yeah. So how do you feel about it now? You're away from it all. You don't live in Washington, D.C. You live in, the, in Georgia. Am I correct in that? Right. So how do you feel about your career? I mean, you, you work for Biden. You write about being a lobbyist and implying that you were closer to Biden than you really were. Are you happy with what you did? or? Well, I, you know, I'm deeply disillusioned with the system. I mean, that's why I left town and that's why I wrote the book. I mean, I hate to sort of tell everybody it's a sad and depressing tale, but, you know, it is a bit of a sad and depressing tale because, I mean, a lot of the book is how I saw Washington change in the 23 years I was there. And I did three rounds of government service, you know, first for Senator Biden, where I felt like he and I tried to contribute as best I could. He was doing, you know, some good for the country. My second round of public service was in the Clinton White House. And I certainly am a big fan of Bill Clinton and believe that, you know, he was a great president. And I, I feel very happy about my public service with Clinton. And then Ted, when Ted became the senator who took Biden's place in the Senate for two years and said immediately he wasn't going to run in the special election, you know, Ted didn't have to raise money to become a senator nor a dollar to stay in the Senate because he was there for two years and wasn't going to run. So he sort of served as an example of what we might get if we took money out of politics. So my last two years in Washington, Ted and I went all out to try to bring about meaningful Wall Street reform, to try to you know pressure the Justice Department to investigate Wall Street in a serious way, to pressure the SEC to do something about computerized trading. And we failed on all three fronts. Mm -hmm. And the book is sort of like, I know why, because those times that I wasn't working in government... I was working as a corporate lobbyist. I was part of the sort of culture of the swamp, you know, in that I had 
gone through the revolving door and I was working as a lobbyist. And I actually feel pretty good about my years as a lobbyist in that, you know, I enjoyed what I was doing. I certainly succeeded at it. I liked the people I was working with. But it was only when I went back into government after the financial crisis where I realized our system has become so corrupted, and I don't use that word in the statutory sense, but in the sort of near corrupted, our, our system has so, become so corrupted by money and power that it simply was unable to respond to the financial crisis in a meaningful way. And so that shocked me and convinced me that I just can't go through the revolving door again, go back into lobbying. I want to leave town. I want to write a book. I mean, the best service I felt like I could provide would be to just lay it all bare. You know, here's what I saw while I was working for Senator Kaufman, you know, in terms of our interactions with the Justice Department and the SEC and the Treasury and the Fed, for that matter. And here's what I experienced in the influence industry. Here's how it works today. Here's how much things have changed and how much worse it's gotten in the time I was there. And, you know, I hope people find the book interesting. One point in your book you write, how could it be that two major Wall Street firms were technically insolvent, but the world didn't know about it? I mean, that was you at the time when you just were being made aware that there was a, a big financial problem. And you sounded surprised by the fact that, that these two firms were insolvent. Am I correct there? Right, right, because it was January of 2008. I was having dinner with a big developer who was involved with the loan committees of Merrill Lynch and Lehman Brothers, along with six or seven other people, and he announced to the table that he had just returned from New York. He had just been in meetings at Merrill Lynch and Lehman Brothers, and both firms, he said, were technically insolvent. And I said, that just can't be true. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just don't believe it. I mean, don't forget, I mean, at the time, both stocks, you know, of Lehman and Merrill were still trading at relatively high levels. So, I mean, the entire investing world did not believe at the time that the firms were technically insolvent. You know, I thought we had a system where we had disclosure, you know, that has independently audited by accountants, as verified, you know, by the SEC. Now, of course, you know, I knew that corporate America had been chipping away at a lot of shareholder protections over the last 20 years, but I still thought we had a system that would prevent blatant fraud. I'm going to and interrupt you a little bit there, because my question is, I mean, you, you've got an MBA from the University of Chicago, then you've got your JD from Stanford, and it's a basic sort of understanding that would have led you to be aware of the way the banking system is constructed. I continually marvel at the sort of comments I get from very well-educated guys, okay? You're as educated as they come. I, I know another guy from University of Chicago who got an MBA. I was in the car with this guy. He's a client of mine, and his daughter called him about a school project, and he didn't know the difference between the primary elections and the general election, okay? Now, there was a guy from Stanford that I know who's a banking analyst, who got his undergraduate degree in economics from Stanford and his MBA from Wharton. And I was saying something about how the money supply was increasing. And he said to me, he goes, Bob, he says, Does, can the Fed really do that? How did they do that? I mean, the guy didn't understand basic stuff, okay? So, Are you implying that I was dumb not to believe this guy? I mean, you know, I mean, what, what I'm going at is I don't know what kind of education is going on. I what mean, got pounded into me for two years at the University of Chicago Business School? Efficient market that investors have access to information and they analyze all available information and the stocks reflect the price, you know, the all available information. I mean, I thought, okay, you know, this guy is obviously aware of some problems at these firms, but I just couldn't believe that the entire investing public had been completely fooled and that it was hidden from view that indeed there were rotting subprime mortgages that filled the balance. Did you know in January of 2008 that you're selling short Merrill Lynch and Lehman Brothers? I mean, if you Throughout did, the summer of 2008. We're talking about January 2008. This is well before Bear Stearns went down. Ben Bernanke was still saying, you know, subprime was not going to affect the rest of the economy. All of our government officials were reassuring us that the subprime mess was not going to have a contagion effect. So I don't think it's all that naive. Of Jeff, actually, I was invited to the Federal Reserve to deliver a speech based upon the fact that I warned in advance of the crisis that it occurred. In 2005, 
two Federal Reserve economists by the name of McCarthy and Peach wrote a paper saying why there was no housing bubble. I wrote a rebuttal to that saying that not only were they wrong, but they are making the greatest mistake since Irving Fisher in 1929 said that stocks would not crash. And the Federal Reserve invited me to explain my views. Throughout the summer of 2008, I warned how things were getting worse and that the crisis could turn into a, a Great Depression. But my point is, the reason I was able to do that is because I understand business cycle theory that is just not taught. Were you taught any business cycle theory at the University of Chicago? Well, I mean, look, I read all the stories throughout 2000, 2006, and 2007, do we have a housing bubble? You know, and half of the people were saying, yes, we did. Half were saying, no, we don't. Right now, you know, people are debating whether there's a bubble in China. I mean, half the people are going to turn out to be right, and the other half are going to be turn out to be wrong, you know? But, I mean, it was not so clear to people that just because this guy stepped off the plane, you know, and said... They're both technically a solvent that I should immediately say, wow, you know, both firms have been running a gigantic fraud. They haven't told, I mean, I just don't think it, you know, it, it's fair of you to imply that I should have immediately jumped to the conclusion. I mean, to me, it's fair for me to say that my education had me biased in the other direction, you know, that, you know, that just can't be true. I even came home and I read a book by Charles Morris called The Trillion Dollar Meltdown, you know, where he spelled out. Again, this is all before Bear Stearns. You know, he spelled out, and, you know, he looks very present in, in hindsight, you know, that we had way overborrowed, and there was so much credit, you know, that the banks had leveraged up. And so I thought to myself, okay, what's the worst thing that could happen? We'll have a 10 to 15% correction. I don't know how to time getting out of the market, getting back into the market. I mean, you know, Lehman Brothers came as a shock to most of the world. I mean, I'm I'm glad that you were ahead of the curve and other, you know, the big short. I mean, Michael Lewis certainly proved that, you know, what we had was a breakdown in due diligence. But, Jeff, my question is, were you taught business cycle theory at the University of Chicago? I know what business cycles are, you know. I mean, that we do have booms and busts, you know. But I don't I don't know how to predict. You know, I believed that we still had, that, you know, you could still put some faith in what the reported quarterly balance sheet was coming out of America. I'm not talking balance sheet right now. We can go into that in a minute. But what I just want to know is, at the University of Chicago, now you've got an MBA. Was there anything being taught there? And, and I don't blame you for this, but I, I just don't think it is. It's 30 years ago. I, you know, I can't remember. I mean, are we using the Socratic method here on your show? <laughs> I mean, why don't you tell me what your point is? Okay, my point is that there was an economist by the name of Friedrich von Hayek who won the Nobel Prize in Economics for Business Cycle Theory who was banned from uh, entering the economics department at the University of Chicago. They stuck him in something called a school of social thought, didn't give him a pension after he left the place saying he wasn't a full professor, but at Gleacher Hall there where your MBA classes are held, they put his picture on the wall and recognized him as the University of Chicago Nobel Prize winner. And basically, I think it's just terrible that throughout the country, there's business cycle theory out there by a Nobel Prize winner that's just not taught and, and not explain to people like you. Once that is explained... I plead guilty to being among the vast majority of even well-educated people who did not see the crisis coming. Okay. Now, let, let's move on to the balance sheet, okay? Uh, because I want to see how MBAs at the University of Chicago think about the balance sheet. What banks did, what Lehman Brothers did, what Bear Stearns did, and what Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley did is... They borrowed short-term and loaned out long-term. That's a prescription. That's a prescription for insolvency if they cannot continue to borrow at that short-term place. They, they, they could have collapsed at any time, uh, it, not necessarily specifically at that point in the financial crisis. It's, it pushes them quicker to that. But the balance sheet is screwed up on banks. There's a fractional reserve system going on where the the assets and the liabilities are not structured. There's your fraud, but it's really basic stuff. That's why during my time with Senator Kaufman, we crafted the Brown-Kaufman Amendment, which would have capped non-deposit liabilities used by banks and non-banks as a percentage of GDP, which Daniel Tarullo of the Fed just said in a speech 
you know, they ought to consider doing. Uh, so even the Senate thinks, so look, I, you're talking to the guy who tried to get the Senate to pass exactly yeah. what you're talking about, a limit on... Yeah. That's not what I'm talking about, because what I'm saying is the markets can control this on their own. No one is going to invest in a bank that is insolvent unless they have uh, backup via the FDIC where they're aware that their uh, their assets are protected. I mean, the, the problem is there's too much government involvement, not less. I mean, your whole book is about how the bad guys get in and influence government power centers, and it seems like you want to create more power centers. The bad guys will figure out a way to get around that. In my view, the thing to do is to eliminate these power centers and let the free markets handle. Are, are you going to put money in a bank where uh, they're, they're borrowing short term and lending long term, and you don't have you don't know if you're actually going to get your money back? It's not going to happen. The free market didn't have the transparency to see what the banks were doing. I mean, that's the whole point of my first anecdote. I mean, you, you may have seen it, you may have believed in business cycle theory, but there wasn't enough transparency into what. The banks were doing, which was why, you know, I believed somewhere in the middle of all this, there was fraudulent behavior going on by the banks and why Ted and I were so aggressive about pushing the Justice Department to investigate these banks to see if some of them were failing to disclose material information. Yeah, the point remains that on the free market, no one would put their money into a bank where they didn't understand where the money went, or they certainly wanted for a long time. They I disagree with that. I mean, we had sophisticated customers who were buying this junk that was being sold by banks. I mean, you say no one would do it. I mean, everybody was doing it. There were AAA-rated credit rating stamps on these securities, and they were buying it without doing any kind of due diligence in the underlying that, funds. That's because they knew they were going to be bailed out. They didn't care. They were running any kind of paper they could. Goldman and, and Morgan, could, like, like you say, the Wall Street, it's not all of Wall Street, it's, it's the crony part of Wall Street, and, and these guys control the show. They don't care, they were, they were making their money on it. You worked for Smith, Barney, and E.F. Hutton, you know, you know how it works. I think there are banks that are too big to fail, but I don't think that everyone who bought CDOs and credit default swaps knew with 100% certainty they were going to be bailed out. Now, in hindsight, they all were bailed out, you know, at 100 cents on the dollar, but Again, I don't think the, the free market was working as well as you say. I mean, if, you're, if your position is that we don't need any sort of financial regulatory framework that ensures that investors get the information they need to make smart analysis, then I disagree with that. I mean, Yeah, I, but who would put money into a black box? I mean, you might get some people to do that, and they're going to lose their money, and they're going to they'll learn their lesson. And that's what happened during the bubble. I mean, a lot of people did. <laughs> you know, a lot of people got crushed. Yeah, but any customer of a bank, learn that it doesn't matter what happens at the financial crisis, their money's protected, so they're not going to look at the bank to see whether it's strong or not, or, or what their balance sheet is, how it's structured. They don't care. Do you care? Does it matter to me what's going on at the bank? I know I'm, I'm protected by the FDIC. It's moral hazard. If you eliminate that, I'm going to look a lot closer at, at where I put my money. Well, that's one set of solutions. I mean, I, I, you know, again... It's true! My book is not a debate of economic theory. I mean, it's really not. I've been a Washington insider for 23 years. Here's how I saw the system working, failing to work. You know, I mean, if you want to take the facts that I laid out and make a different, you know, theory about what to be done, ought to be done as a solution, well, fine, you know, make your arguments. You're attacking this without understanding any of the basic fundamental economics behind it. I, I totally agree with you. Okay. What am I attacking? What I mean, I, you know, I wrote. I've got it right in front of me. You're attacking Wall Street and saying they need to be more regulated. Okay. You're saying the first Wall point I make is the Justice Department failed to adequately investigate Wall Street executives for whether fraud occurred. Do you disagree with me on that point? Because, you know, I saw you didn't. I mean, I know for a fact... I think the, f the fraud is, is just a, a secondary problem. I, I don't think that's the main problem. I think the main problem is, is government regulation, which created a situation where people didn't care. You don't care if there's rampant fraud on Wall Street. I mean, you know, that's just a secondary problem. We don't need to beef up law enforcement. But the fraud wouldn't have been there if you didn't have FDIC creating moral hazard. The fraud wouldn't have been there because people would have looked a lot closer. This is what Greenspan said, and he, he admitted he was wrong. I mean, he thought people would look out for their own interests 
and that we didn't need any kind of fraud in force. I, I don't want to get, to get into a debate about Alan Greenspan here, but this is a guy that has flip-flopped on everything in his life, whatever whatever position. I'm willing to defend my book, but, I mean, you're mischaracterized. So point one is Justice Department failed to adequately investigate Wall Street. Point two is that the SEC is years behind the curve in understanding what has transformed our stock markets from a floor-based system of just five or six years ago to electronic trading where we have high-frequency trading transformed so much that the SEC has no ability to detect whether or not there's any manipulation going on in the stock market. And again, people defend that all day long. Apparently, you don't care about fraud in the stock market, but I do. You know? No, no, no. Uh, it's, it's not that I don't care about fraud. My view is that if, if you didn't have the FDIC and the moral hazard there where people don't care about where the money is so they don't pay attention to the fraud, the fraud wouldn't occur. People would not put their money. You, you'd have individual fraud situations, but not we national. That. Uh, I mean, you know, well, we can't test because we did have moral hazard, but I, I think it's pretty do. clear. This, there, is, there is no one in, there is no, Jeff, there is no one in America that is concerned about their money in a bank. It's it's that simple. No one is looking at the balance sheets or or reading reports to see if their their bank is safe. It's a total moral hazard of the entire situation. Nobody cares what Jamie Dimon is up to or Lloyd Blank fine. They don't care. I think poll numbers would show you that people think there has been in fact I saw a recent poll that think eighty percent of the American public don't think enough has been done about policing corporate wrongdoing. Yeah, but that's not the question of are they concerned about the money in the bank they have it in? They, they're not. They're, they're just not. And, and that's where the problem comes in. My point number three in the book, you know, Justice Department didn't go after fraud. SEC is miles behind in uh, rapidly transforming stock market. And point three is we should have done something structural about too big to fail banks by either limiting their size or, you know, tapping non-profit liabilities. Exactly what you were saying before. I mean, they're financing with very short term and there's no limit on their ability to you know use this short term finance and to finance very risky long term assets. Right. And nobody cares. Because of the structure the government has for the banking system and makes it a, a situation where nobody cares. And and you're you're fighting an impossible battle. You're 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 not fighting it at the core where it needs to be fought. All right. Yeah. The IC as well there you go. There you go. I mean it's a situation where you, you want to protect people, and, and you're setting up a situation where rampant fraud can continue because nobody cares what's going on at the banks, and the banks are powerful enough they can influence the government and keep them off their backs. But if people were really concerned about their money and understood the mismatching of assets and liabilities and, and other stuff that goes on, you, you never have bank structures, banks the type you have now. But anyways, let's move on. And I did read your book in full, and, and I'm going to read a quote from here because I just find this interesting. You write early on in the book, the difference between Paulson and Geithner was that Rubin had sprinkled his magic dust on Geithner, so Obama and his team were all cross-eyed for him. Okay? Now, I find that interesting, but are you aware of the relationship between Obama's mother and Geithner's father? No. Okay. It turns out that Obama's mother, when she was in Indonesia, was in charge of microfinance. And there are indications that was being used by the CIA as a front. At the same time, Timothy Geithner's father was head of microfinance for the Ford Foundation. And you may or may not know this, but the Ford Foundation is, is a a major source of uh, CIA operators. And um, Geithner's father was Obama's mother's high-level boss. They met at least once. We know this from a pension fund article. But they most certainly could have met many other times. So you basically have a situation where that's what was protecting Geithner as far as I'm concerned. I think you're going a thousand miles away for an explanation that's right in front of you. I mean, Michael Froman, who was a Citigroup executive, was working, you know, and former chief of staff to Bob Rubin, was working as the head of personnel for the Obama transition. Geithner had worked for Rubin at the Treasury Department under Clinton. Right. When they all met, you know, early on in the Obama transition, it was, as I say in the book, you know, they all sort of believed that, you know, they weren't very financially sophisticated people, Obama. Biden and most of the early people around him, they felt like they had to turn to the Clinton-era 
you know, financial Wall Street technocrats to fix the problem, which, as I say in the book, I thought was a huge mistake. I don't think it has anything to do with Obama's mother. And, you know, I think it was, you know, they would have had Bob Rubin come back to be Treasury Secretary if they didn't sort of belatedly realize how responsible he was himself, you know, for the financial crisis. So they ended up hiring a lot of Rubenites, and, and the Rubenites were Larry Summers and, and Geithner. Yeah, I don't doubt, I don't question that uh, that Rubin had a major influence there, uh, very, very, very strong influence, and, and it continues to this day. But the Geithner connection, when he had that early problem with his TurboTax and other early presentations that he made, he was protected, in my view, beyond Rubin. Rubin likes Geithner a lot, but I suspect it goes beyond that. And and maybe Geithner gets in at the New York Fed early on, but I just find it very curious, the connection between Geithner's father and Obama's mother. I find that a stretch. <laughs> what, that, that Geithner's father and Obama's mother knew each other early on, and you don't, you don't think that's significant? And both operating as likely CIA operatives? I find that to be balderdash. <laughs> you don't think it's true? I mean, do you think it happened or not? I have no reason. I've never once read anything about this. Yeah, why do you think that's the case? As a matter of fact, there was one small article in the New York Times about it. Uh, don't you think that would be something that would be brought up? I have a much more logical explanation for what happened. You know, I mean, let's agree that what you said is true. I still don't think it was the dispositive reason why Geithner was named Treasury Secretary. I, had a, I think it had a lot more to do with Bob Rubin and, you know, his influence over the early days of the Obama administration. Yeah, that probably helped, certainly as far as bringing Geithner in, but I, I think there was more to it, especially when the TurboTax problem came up and then his, his early problems when he met the press. I mean, a lot of other guys would have been, been cut by that point. But, but anyways, we can move on. So what do you see now as, as the solutions to uh, the financial crisis or what should be done in the banking system? Well, I don't want to get back to the same conversation we just had, but I mean, to me, you know, the fundamental problem is we have lawlessness in our financial markets, that we don't have any kind of effective law enforcement. You know, we don't have any deterrence of individual fraud because the Justice Department has been so weak about policing it. And in the securities markets, we don't even have a technical capability to look at stock trades in a real-time seeing as fast as they're taking place to know whether or not there's any kind of manipulation. And I still believe we need structural reform to resolve this sort of conflict. You know, too big to fail, too big to regulate, too big to manage, too big to jail, uh, you know, banks. At the root of it all is a Washington system that has become so enmeshed with Wall Street because of the centripetal force of money people and the revolving door that, you know, we don't have policy making in Washington right now that's divorced from excessive influence by Wall Street. Yeah, but so, but my point is, how do you, how are you going to change this? I mean, do you think changing the rule? As I say in the book, you know, look, if I had, if I could change it tonight, I would, but I mean, it's going to take educated opinion. It's going to take non-financial corporate America sort of waking up and realizing, you know, we can't have financial instability caused by Wall Street crises every three to five years. You know, we need our, our politicians and elected officials to be listening to power groups outside of Wall Street uh, to come up with solutions that ensure that we have decades-long financial stability so our economy can thrive. And, you know, how do we get money out of the system? That's a tough one. You know, after Citizens United, after decades of Supreme Court jurisprudence on, you know, money being the equivalent of speech, you know, it's probably going to take a constitutional amendment, and that's not easy. That's how you close your book. You close your book on the point of, of getting money out of the system. But I don't see that as the problem. The problem, in my view, is is creating these these central power centers where, where the bad guys are just going to go after them. If, if you make some kind of rules of, about money not being influenced, they, they're going to figure out a way. If the power is there, somebody's going to figure out a way to get to it. And it, it'll probably end up being even even more corrupt and more under the table and, and more hidden from public view if, if you, you even take the money out of it. But the real problem is just the essential power. I, it, it just baffles me that guys like you who have been in the system just don't see that. I mean, the, the problem is when there's a rule or regulation, the guy that wants to influence it is going to be a bad guy, and he's going to try and figure it out. Right. 
regulatory capture. Woodrow Wilson warned about this in 1913. I mean, you know, there, whenever you have government making decisions that affect big business, that affect sectors of the economy, and if you're asking me to sort of accept a rat, you know, radical surgery that we should take away all banking regulation and end the IC and end, you know, our system of deposit insurance, I mean, I just don't think that's even remotely realistic. I mean, you can argue it on ideological grounds. You can talk about Hayek. You can talk about all the big business cycle theory you want. But, you know, it, to me, it, you're living on another planet. I mean, you know, we're, we're not going to end the fact that we have a federal government that extends its hands and fingers into a lot of the economy, you know. And all we can do is try to work for solutions on the margin to try to make things better and, and to prevent another devastating financial crisis. Yeah, but Jeff, you're not addressing, in my view, what causes the financial crisis. So they're, they're going to come again, and it goes back to Hayek, it goes back to the business cycle, and it goes back to all these things that are out of reach. But they're not out of reach. You're just not taught them in elitist schools. That's part of the problem. It would take a libertarian party to arise that would, you know, with, you know, tens of millions of voters supporting it. And, uh, you know, maybe you'll get there one day, you know, but I mean, I don't think that's going to happen, you know, and, and my, so I triage, you know, I mean, my approach is, okay, there, there are probably more, I mean, look, I mean, if there's one thing Ted and I learned while we were in the Senate, you know, it's hard enough to get reasonable ideas on the margin implemented. If Ted had gone to the floor and, you know, made the kind of speeches you're making, you know, no one would have paid any attention to him. Ron Paul made those speeches regularly in the House and he's got a following across the country. So maybe some people are afraid to make those kind of speeches, but those speeches catch a lot of ears, and this despite the fact that the, the media attention is generally not there as far as his ideas. I've seen a lot of Ron Paul, and I, you know, I watched a lot of Republican debates, and while I certainly heard his critique of the Fed, I mean, I didn't hear him calling for ending the regulatory system dealing with banks. He may not have put that on the front burner. The Fed is a much bigger problem because it is the main cause, again, of the uh, financial crisis. No question about that. Just study Hayek business cycle theory, Austrian business cycle theory. But Ron Paul certainly would have understood the, or does understand, the problems with the FDIC. He didn't talk about it while he was running for president, you know. Yeah, it's kind of my point on your book. I mean, you're, you're talking about the fraud in the banking system, and there is some of that. But it's not the top priority. The top priority is to end the business cycle, and that's at the Fed. So, I mean, he's got a lot of work there to do before he goes on to FDIC or, or the, the fraud you're talking about. But anyways, Jeff, I, I want to thank you very much for, for coming on the show. And I'll tell you, I did read your book in full. It's called The Payoff, Why Wall Street Always Wins. We'll put a link to it on our site. And I actually found it interesting and valuable for anyone who wants to get a sense for the inner workings of Washington. I mean, you're part of it, and I, I think my views on how to deal with things go beyond yours, but for an actual insight into how things work, who ignores you, what you do, what happens when you're a lobbyist, and you're quite frank about the way you uh, gave the impression that you were much closer to Biden than you were when you were a lobbyist and how that worked to your advantage and, and, and the money that it brought in and so on and so forth. So it's a very valuable book that way, and, and I think it's important, and good luck. And, and I hope a lot of people realize it and realize that, you know, Washington is a swamp, and, and the less regulation we bring in, the better off it is. Well, thanks for having me, Robert. I appreciate it, and thanks for a spirited debate. <laughs> sure. Take care. Okay. Bye, Jeff. Okay, now joining me is Chris Rossini for a new segment called Wrap Up with Rossini. Chris is the executive producer of The Robert Wenzel Show, and you'll also notice that he's an occasional poster at economicpolicyjournal.com. Very popular poster. He usually puts up about one post a day, and you guys flock to it. So uh, we're bringing him on the radio show so we can shed his views on the interview that just went on, and we can discuss it a little bit. Chris, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Bob, very much uh, for that, for uh, thinking of this idea of including me in the show as well as your website. I'm having a blast writing. And I'm very happy by the response from the readers of economicpolicyjournal.com. So, Chris, what did you think? 
Uh, well, I actually enjoyed this interview. Uh, I'd like to start off by giving Connaughton a lot of credit because unlike previous guests that were uh, challenged like Robert Shapiro and Neil Barofsky, he didn't hang up. He didn't hang up. Yeah, he uh, he stuck in there. He stated his case clearly. You know, we may not necessarily agree with it, but I give him credit for hanging in there. And, uh, you know, that's something that even Paul Krugman won't do. He won't. He refuses to bait Bob Murphy. So and it's not easy to go up against somebody with opposing views, go on their show. And uh, I think he did a good job. Yeah, and, and I think we took him a little bit by surprise, but I think with regard to him, part of it is his background. I mean, the guys that can really handle debates in a back and forth, especially uh, with a phone interview, are guys who have had the training as a broker. He worked at, he was an investment banker for Smith Barney and E.F. Hutton, and then he went on to uh, to raise money for Joe Biden, and he was a big money raiser for Joe Biden, but that was all phone work. But all three of those positions, you're dealing with objections all the time. So you learn to overrule them, partly with logic, but partly with emotion. I think that's what we saw with this. I mean, he, he just went out and said things strongly with conviction. But if you really pull them apart, maybe logically they don't all hold. But he's got that background. So, uh, you know, watch out for those guys that uh, ha have that background because they, they can be really powerful and, and uh, strong with their presentations. I agree. And uh, I'd also like to point out one thing that I also picked up from this interview is even though, you know, he's had, he mentioned he had a 30-year uh, relationship with Joe Biden, it's easy to fall into a trap to think that people, you know, well-educated, high up on the uh, political ladder, that they really do understand, you know, what we consider real economics, Austrian economics, and maybe they have like a nefarious plan to uh, use it to their advantage. But uh, Connaughton, you know, he had no problem saying that he doesn't know Austrian business cycle theory, wasn't able to see what was coming with the Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns. And uh, so they really just don't know it. And uh, very similar to your Fed speech, you pointed out that, you know, these are guys at the Federal Reserve. They don't even know the difference between Keynesianism and Chicago school. So the Austrians out there, we have a lot of work ahead of us. We have to really get our views, push them even harder because they really aren't known. Yeah, I was a little tough on Jeff with regard to his background. This kind of awareness about a business cycle, it, it, they, they don't get that in college at all. So it's not surprising that they don't understand it. That as I pointed out in the interview, if, if you had banks that weren't backed up by the FDIC, which creates the moral hazard, you wouldn't have a situation where people would not be concerned about what was going on at their banks. Right now, it doesn't matter where you where you put your money. You know that the FDIC is going to back you up. On the FDIC, it gives people a false sense of the risk that's involved with putting your money in a bank. Okay, that concludes Recap with Rossini. Thanks, Chris. We'll talk to you next week. Great. Thanks again. Thank you for listening to The Robert Wenzel Show. This is Robert Wenzel. Be sure to check out my website, economicpolicyjournal.com, where I blog seven days a week about economics, finance, politics, and liberty. Executive producer of The Robert Wenzel Show is Chris Rossini. Head of editing and mastering is John Daubert. <laughs>